video in how to teach vocabulary. We're going to start by having a look at um, Edutopia's article because it breaks it down into a really nice six-step process. So if you read the Ed Edutopia article, as I said, there are six steps and they base this on the approach done by Robert Mar Marzano. So in step one, the teacher explains a new word. So the teacher introduces the new word, but going beyond the definition by really activating students' prior knowledge and using images and scaffolding, asking questions rather than telling. Remember, ask, don't tell. Step two, the students restate or explain the new word in their own words. So they'll be able to demonstrate that they've understood by giving a synonym or using it in a sentence or finding an antonym. Step three, students create a non-linguistic representation. This is just a fancy way of saying you get them to draw something or a symbol to remind them what the word is. Step four, they engage in activities to deepen their knowledge. So these are like comparing words, classifying terms, writing their analogy and analogies, you know, really sort of understanding where the words come from. Step five, get them to use the new word in a cooperative activity. And step six, playing games to, reviewing, to review new vocabulary and do this periodically. So what does this look like? Well, let's take an example. Let's say I was teaching a group of really young students and they were learning English for the first time and I wanted to use a really simple word like cat. Now I could probably start off just by saying, look, this is a cat and show them an image. What is this? I'd say, what is this? What is this? And then I would model, right? I do. This is a cat. C -at cat. And I'd probably draw it on the board too. So that way I'm connecting the images with the phonemes. Okay. The next step would be in modeling. This is a cat, right? And then circle. This is a cat, cat. Then I would do some scaffolding and I'll say, what is this? A cat, I point to a confident learner. And then I point to someone else. What is this? A cat. Good, everybody together. What is this? A cat. Good. Then we take it to the next level and we talk about some of the sounds, so the phonemes. Which letter makes the ah uh, sound? Ah, yes, good. This is the letter A, circle the letter A. Okay, and I could then talk about the T sound. What makes the sound t, 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 at, at, and, and point to the A and point to the T. From there, we'd probably find other similar words. Fat, rat, bat. That's where we play our rhyming games and have sing songs. Okay. And then I would work again with the word in context. So we would maybe sing a song about fat cats out on the map have a rhyme, play a game, um, even do some worksheets. Okay, so that's how we might start it off with really, really low level beginners. As they get more and more used to um, learning vocabulary and they get more advanced, we progress to things like flashcards. This is one of my favorite techniques. I'm still using this technique with my kids. My son is in secondary one enriched and he's learning 10 new words every week in his enriched class. So we put together flashcards and I do this actually physically with him. Like we have physical flashcards, um, but we also do it online. There are some free online sites that you can use. So yeah, um, I've also done it where you can post it in the class. So we have a word wall. Anyone, any, anytime anyone comes across a new word, we have it on the wall and have pictures of it. We create it in a giant poster. It's a lot of fun. And I get the kids to create their own flashcards and bring them in. So the more they're involved in their learning, the better it is. If you have, if you read the Sheehan article on how to teach word, how to teach vocabulary and words, you'll notice that his very first strategy he talks about is asking students to create a systematic vocabulary notebook. And this reminds me of the step three in Edutopia. Edutopia where the students create a non-linguistic representation, right? So they have their own vocabulary notebook and you can get them to do this 
um, alphabetically or according to meanings or categories of words or themes, you can decide. So this is the kind of information that uh, Sheehan asks his students to do, and this is, this is really helpful because it's individual. So he asks them to write the word in their own language, to draw a picture or a symbol, to write down anything that will help them pronounce, and maybe some extra words, as well as collocations. So we'll talk about that in a second. Things like uh, if the L1 word is cash, then cash, cash register, sorry, if the word is register, then it's cash register, class register, registration form. You'll have to register first, sample sentence. And this will work for students of all different levels. And it's a really nice concrete way for them to reflect on what they've learned through your course of your English class. It's nice for them to see traces and you can start from beginners all the way up to really advanced students. The second strategy Sheehan talks about is really teaching students the meta language of vocabulary. So what does that mean? Well, you need to know, first of all, to teach words, right? Our usual category of words. This is what we usually think about when we're talking about vocabulary. But Sheehan also points out that we should also teach collocations. And this is what I find so amazing because I confess to you, when I first started teaching ESL, um, it took me years, literally years, to, to figure out why there were so many grammar rules in English that just didn't seem to respond to, <laughs> to any kind of rhyme or reason. There were, seems to be more exceptions than there were words following the rules. So for example, I would ask students to learn things like prepositions, in, out, on, to, from, with, by. And we would you know, learn the rule, we would then have a quiz, and then the next time they started to write something, it would always cause confusion. And they asked me, well, why is it get into trouble and not get in, you know, get to trouble, or get with trouble, or get by trouble? And what is, why is it sort of, why are our initial reaction together? And why is it to be confused by and not to be confused with, or to be confused to or from? Well, that's just because these words that go together called collocations need to be learned not like grammar, but like vocabulary. So my initial instinct to just tell them, well, that's just the way it is, was actually correct. Because <laughs> why is fruit spelled the way it's spelled? Well, because that's just the way it is. Why is get into trouble always come together? Because that's just the way it is. We need to teach these ex words expressions like vocabulary, not like grammar. And once we kind of get over that, wow, it makes a lot more sense and grammar becomes teaching grammar and vocabulary becomes teaching vocabulary. The other thing uh, Sheehan talks about is teaching fixed expressions. And these are really, really useful ones. And this is where functional language in the um, programme de formation d'éducation au Québec, so the progression of learning, we're going to see all of our functional language in there. So things like, I'll see what I can do. How are you? Nice to meet you. If we can teach them these fixed expressions like vocabulary, it's going to be very helpful for our students. And finally, as they get older, especially, um, you can teach them sentence frames. So this is really helpful for students when they're starting to write. So if they're writing narratively, one of the most famous narrative sentence frames is, once upon a time, um, but if they're going into academic you'll and trying to convince people of something or giving an expository text, these are some of the common things you'll see. Many people believe, according to research, that kind of stuff. So you can teach them these chunks of language and that'll be really helpful. Okay, so um, aside from the vocabulary notebook and understanding that we need to teach vocabulary in chunks and not just words. Sheehan also suggests, suggests three main strategies for teaching vocabulary. He says you can teach by topic or theme, and this is a great approach to take. So if you're teaching a, to a theme around superheroes, then you can have all these words that are associated, or teaching animals, or teaching by food. 
it's really great because this is actually the way that our brain works. We start with a topic and then we make connections to things we already know and kind of slot new information in. So that's one way we can teach. It says we can also teach by meaning. So really focusing in on the meaning, especially using images and placing the words in context. And finally, we can teach by looking at form. So this is like things like root words, prefixes, suffixes. Okay, let's have a look at each one of these one by one. So the first one is teaching by topic. So two of the activities he suggests if you want to teach by topic, first of all, you would start with your theme, as I say, animals, foods, um, modes of transport, all, you know, all of these common ones. Um, and you can use word groups and word webs. So word group, groups, you can take a list of related words and teach students to categorize them according to meaning. And this is an example. Brainstorm all these different words and you can categorize them by the kind of food that they eat or the place that they live or the number of legs they have. I don't know. <laughs> Um, whether they're domesticated, whether they're wild. So you can have a lot of fun just moving those around in groups. Really great for tactile. A second activity is to use word webs. And this is what I was talking about, the flashcards. I love having a word wall in my classroom. So you write the topic in the center and then you add categories around it. Food, fruit, meat. And where does meat come from? Well, then you can pull onto your animals. <laughs> Cow, sheep, pig. The second approach he talked about was meaning activities. So this is where we slide in our collocations, the groups of words that are found together. And we can also group words by common meaning. So for example, size. And the, really the focus of this is looking at which words go together in English which words don't. So here's one example that he talks about which adjectives are usually found with which nouns. And you can have fun with this. You can get kids to mix and match, play some games. Do we have a hot sea or mild sea? How about a sweet bed? No. Nope. How about a soft or easy bed? Mm -hmm. So um, another way to look at adjectives is to really think about the extreme word. And this is great for especially if you're moving um, from sort of beginner in intermediate to intermediate more advanced to really help students increase their vocabulary. So if they're always using the word like hot or bad, get them to find more adjectives that are sort of more descriptive. You can also teach vocabulary by form, and that's the third approach he talks about. And we start by looking at root words. So here I'm taking as an example intelligent. So you can teach the word intelligent, and you can talk about that. Um, but then you can look at its prefixes and play around with that. Unintelligent. To be intelligent means one thing, but to be unintelligent is what? You can then play around with things like acceptable, unacceptable, inhabited uninhabited. Okay, so that students get the idea that un signifies negative. You can also look at suffixes. So if you have the root word intelligent, then you can look at the suffix ly, intelligently. What happens when you add ly to the end? Well, an adjective becomes an adverb. Okay, so any words that end in ly in English, take a look carefully and you'll see they're often adverbs. And here's his activity looking at some suffixes here with less and full. So which ones can be use, full, use, less. So full signifies what, less signifies what. The great thing about teaching vocabulary by form in this way is it really provides the students with a learning skill. So that when they're on their own and they come across a word that they haven't seen before, they can take a really good guess at the meaning, if they know what some of the most common prefixes are and suffixes are and what those signify. So there are lots of other common activities, um, as we talked about with step five and six, so playing games, puzzles, word searches, crosswords, matching, identifying games and songs. 
So for the last couple of slides, I want you to look at um, these four pages from an activity book that's really focusing on teaching some vocabulary. And the question I want you to answer is, what kinds of activities is this work, workbook using to teach vocabulary? So just to get you started, what's happening here? Well, this looks like a word web. Take your time and have a look at these next pages and see if you can take some notes on the side. What kind of activities are they? Feel free to pause the video. So that's it. So for the online class, just a reminder, your task is to research a game or activity that teaches vocabulary and be ready to present it um, in three minutes or less in your breakout groups.